Hello and welcome to the third installment of Books in Beds and Buses where I am reading Harold and Maud by Colin Higgins. We are on page 20 when I last left off. My computer died last time. So. Brigadier General E. Victor Ball had in fact been General MacArthur's aide-de-camp for a short time in 1945, but in all fairness to MacArthur, he could hardly have been said to have been the general's right-hand man, partly because he had played no role in any command decision, but mainly because he had no right hand. Indeed, he had no right arm as it had been shot off during training maneuvers at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Normally an officer would be expected to retire after such a distinction, but General Ball was not the type of man who gave up without a fight. As he saw it, the biggest handicap in the army brought the biggest handicap in the army brought about by the lack of a right arm was the inability to salute in the required military fashion. After some experimentation, he devised a mechanical device that lay folded on his empty sleeve. When he pulled the cord on his foyer, foyeragi, I can't uh, read late at night. Um, with his left hand, the sleeve sprang up to his forehead, driving, delivering a snappy West Point salute. With this device and the influence of several friends at the Pentagon, General Ball was able to make the Army his career. And as he said to his nephew, The Army is not only my home, Harold. It is my life, and it could be your life, too. I don't know. I know how your mother feels. She insists I hold on to your draft records, but if it were up to me, I'd process your file and have you shipped off to basic tomorrow. Believe me, you'd have a grand time. The general stood up from his desk and gestured at the military posters hunging, ha, hung on his office walls. Take a look around you, Harold, he said. There's the army drubbing the spikes in San Juan, clubbering the chinks and whipping the redskins, and battling its way across the Remagen Bridge. Ah, uh, it's a great life. It offers history and education, action, adventure, advising. You'll see the war firsthand, and plenty of slant-eyed curls. Why, it'll make a man out of you, Harold. Put on a uniform, and you'll walk tall, and glint in your eye, and a spring in your step, and the knowledge in your heart that you are fighting for peace, and are serving your country. He stopped before a portrait of Nathan Hale with a noose about his neck. Just like Nathan Hale, he said pulling his lanyard and his sleeves snapped up a salute. That's what this country needs, more Nathan Hales. He paused at attention in front of the portrait before he let his sleeve fall neatly back to place. And do you know what? said the general, turning to Harold, seated by the window. What? Harold said. The general stood in front of him and confidently bent down. I think, he whispered slowly, I think I see a little Nathan Hale in you. Harold stared blankly back at his uncle. The general smiled and punched him in the shoulder. Think about it, he said, and walked back to his desk. Harold's decapitated head stood upright on the silver serving platter while Harold placed sprigs of parsley in the blood around his neck. When he heard his mother coming down the stairs, he quickly placed a large silver cover over the serving dish and put it under the table. He left the dining room to meet her in the hall. Harold, dear, I have only a few minutes, but I want to inform you of my decision. Please sit down. Harold sat, Miss Chasen. Harold sat down, and Miss Chasen started to put on her long white gloves. Harold, she said, matter-of-factly. It is time for you to begin thinking of your future. You are nineteen, almost twenty. You have led an idle, happy, carefree life up until the present. The life of a child. But now it's time to put away childish things and take on adult responsibilities. 
Well, we would all like to sail through life with no thought of tomorrow, but that cannot be. We have our duties, our obligations, our principles. In short, said Miss Chasen, finishing with her gloves, I think it's time you got married. What? Harold said. Married, said Miss Chasen, picking up her evening purse and going to the door. We are going to find you a girl so you can get married. Harold knelt in the church and listened to the organ playing softly. He looked above the altar at the large stained glass window showing St. Thomas Aquin's writing in a book with a feather. Thomas never got married, thought Harold, and glanced over at the man in the open coffin. I wonder if he ever did. I wonder who he was anyway. Silver-haired Father Finnegan stepped up to the pulpit and scanned the few isolated mourners before him. He opened his book, as he had done countless times before. And so, dear brethren, let us pray to the Lord, King of glory, that he may bless and deliver all souls of the faithfully departed from the pains of hell and the bottomless pit, deliver them from the lion's mouth and the darkness therein, but rather bring them to the bliss of heaven, the holy light, and eternal rest. As Father Finnegan continued his weary prayer, Harold, kneeling on the back, kneeling near the back of the church, quietly sat, sat up. He looked over at a portrait of the sorrowing Madonna. Psst! Harold listened. Psst! Harold turned around. Across the aisle, three rows back, a white-haired old lady smiling and gaily waving at him. Harold turned back. That was the woman at the cemetery, he said to himself, the one eating watermelon. What does she want with me? Psst. Harold turned. Harold started and turned. The old lady had moved. She now knelt right behind him. She grinned. Like some licorice, she asked sweetly, offering him a little bag. She spoke with a slight British European accent. Uh, no, thank you, whispered Harold, and knelt down. You're welcome, she whispered back. Keeping his eyes on the altar, Harold listened intensely. After a few minutes, he had heard the old lady get up noisily from her pew. Walk into his pew and kneel beside him. She gave him a friendly jab. Did you know him? she asked, gesturing at the deceased. Uh, no, Harold whispered, trying to appear involved in, in the service. Neither did I, said the old lady brightly. I heard he was eighty years old. I'll be eighty next week. A good time to move on, don't you think? I don't know, said Harold. Standing up with the rest of the congregation, Father Finnegan blessed the coffin and the pallbearers pallbearers wheeled it out. I mean, 75 is too too early, the old lady continued, standing beside him. <clears throat> but at 85, well, you're just marking time, and you may as well look over the horizon. The few mourners filed out of the church. Harold felt a tug on his sleeve. Look at them, she whispered to him loudly. I've never understood this mania for black. I mean... No one sends black flowers, do they? Black flowers are dead flowers. And who sends dead flowers to a funeral? She laughs. How absurd, she said. It's change. It's all change. Harold walked out of the pew and the old lady followed. What do you think of that old fat Tom, she asked. Who? said Harold. St. Thomas up there. I saw you looking at him. I think he's a, a great thinker. Oh, yes, but a little old-fashioned, don't you think? Like Rose Swan. Oh, dear, look at her. They stopped before the 
the dower portrait of the Madonna. May I borrow this, she said, taking the felt pen from Harold's coat pocket. And with a few deft strokes, she drew a cherry smile on the virgin's mouth. Harold looked about the empty church to see if anyone was watching. There, that's better, said the old lady. They never give the poor thing a chance to laugh. Heaven knows she's had a lot to be happy about. In fact, she added, looking at several statues in the back of the church, they all have a lot to be happy about. Excuse me. Harold made a half-hearted gesture for his pen, but to no avail. The old lady was already in the back of the church, drawing smiles on St. Joseph and St. Anthony and St. Teresa. An unhappy saint is a contradiction in terms, she explained. Ah, yes, Harold, said Harold nervously. And why do they go, and why do they go on about that, she asked. Harold looked over at the crucifix. You'd think, she said, walking out the door, that no one ever read about read the end of the story. Harold followed her out to the street. Uh, could I have my pen back now, please, he asked. Oh, of course, she said, giving it to him. What is your name? Harold Chasen. How do you do, she smiled. I'm the Countess Madahill Shaden, but you can call me Maud. When she smiled, the lines around her eyes made them seem even more sparkling and blue. Harold politely offered his hand. Nice to meet you, he said. She shook his hand. I think we'll sh we shall be great friends, don't you? She took a large ring of keys from her purse and opened the door of the car at the curb. Can I drop you anywhere, Harold? she asked. No. Harold answered quickly, Thank you, I have my own car. Well then, I must be off. We shall have to meet again. Inside the church, Father Flanagan stood dumbfounded before the beaming statues. Maud reached the motor and released the brakes. Harold, she called, do you dance? What? Do you sing and dance? Uh, no. No, she smiled sadly. I thought not. She stepped on the gas, and with a great screech of burning rubber, the car flew from the curb and tore down the street, spun around a distant corner. One could still hear the gears shifting in the distance. Harold stared at it in wonderment. Father Finnegan, who was standing in the church door, had also seen it depart. That woman, he said, to no one in particular, she took my car! few more pages. Okay. <clears throat> Miss Chasen sat at the desk in the den and spoke to her son standing opposite her. I have here, Harold, the form sent out by the National Computer Dating Service, she said. It seems to me, since you don't get along with any of the daughters of any of my friends, that this is the best way to find you a prospective wife. Harold opened his mouth, but his mother waved any objection aside. Please, Harold, she said, sit down. We have a lot to do, and I have to be the, to be at the dressmaker's at three. She looked over the papers. The computer dating service offers you at least three dates on the initial investment. They say they screen out the fat and the ugly, so it's obviously a firm of high standards. I'm sure they can find you at least one girl who is compatible. Harold drew over a chair and sat down. Now first, here's the personality interview, which you are to fill out and return. There are 50 questions with five possible responses to check. A, for absolutely yes. B, yes. C, not sure. D, no. E, absolutely no. Are you ready, Harold? Harold looked at his mother with, mourn with his mournful brown eyes. The first question is, Are you uncomfortable meeting new people? Well, I think that's a yes. Don't you agree, Harold? Even an absolutely yes. We'll put down an A on that. Number two. 
Should sex education be taught inside our home? I would say no. Taught outside the home? I would say no. Wouldn't you, Harold? We'll give it a D there. Three. Do you enjoy spending a lot of time by yourself? Well, that's easy, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Mark A. Should women run for President of the United States? I don't see why not. Absolutely, yes. Do you often invite friends into your home? No, you never do, Harold. Absolutely no. Do you often feel that perhaps life isn't worth living? Hmm? Miss Chasen glanced up. What would you say, Harold? Harold glazed. Gla Harold looked glazed at his mother. You think A or B? He blinked. Well, let's put down a C, not sure. 7. Is the subject of sex being overexploited by our mass media? That would have to be a yes, wouldn't it? Do judges favor some lawyers? Yes, I suppose they do. Is it acceptable for a school teacher to smoke or drink in public? As Miss Chasen rattled on, Harold slowly opened his coat and took out a small gun. Reaching into his side pocket, he brought out six bullets. And while his mother filled out the questionnaire, he, ca <clears throat> he carefully and deliberately loaded each bullet into the chamber. <coughs> Do you sometimes have headaches or backaches after a difficult day? Yes, I do indeed. Do you go to sleep easily? I'd say so. Do you believe in capital punishment for murder? Oh, yes. Do you believe churches have a strong influence to upgrade the general morality? Yes, again. In your opinion, are social affairs usually a waste of time? Heavens, no. Can God influence our lives? Yes, absolutely yes. Have you ever crossed the street to avoid meeting someone? Well, I'm sure you have, haven't you, dear? Harold inserted the last bullet and slapped the, snapped the chamber shut. He looked up at his mother. She was too absorbed to hear anything. He pulled back the hammer, cocking the gun. She still reads on. Did you enjoy life as a child? Oh, yes, she sighed, turning the page and continuing. You were a wonderful baby, Harold. He slowly raised the gun until it was pointing directly at her head. Does your personal religion or philosophy include a life after death? Oh, yes, indeed. That's absolutely. Do you have ups and downs without obvious reasons? You do, don't you, dear? We'll mark A. Harold watched and listened. Slowly he turned the gun around until he was looking straight down the barrel. Do you remember jokes and take pleasure in relating them to others? You don't, do you, dear? Mark E. Gradually he tightened his finger around the trigger. Do you think the sexual, sexual revolution has gone too far? It certainly has. It certainly seems to have. <laughs> Should evolution, with a loud blast, the gun fired, knocking him back, backwards out of the chair onto the floor. He lay there lifelessly as blood trickled from a neat hole on his forehead. Miss Chasen looked up. Harold, she said impatiently. Harold, please, did you hear me? Should evolution be taught in our public schools? I don't think I'm getting through to Mother like I used to, Harold confided to Dr. Harley later that day. Oh, said the doctor. Harold brooded briefly. I think I'm losing my touch. Dark gray clouds rolled in from the coast, and the wind rustled at the trees of the cemetery. Father Finnegan gla glanced up from the burial service and decided that it looked like rain. He skipped the holy water and began the final prayers. Harold looked about the small group of mourners. Some put up their umbrellas. 
and huddled beneath them. Others stood silently, their hats in their hands. Psst! Harold turned. Across the grave, Maud, unfit in a yellow raincoat, outfitted in a yellow raincoat and matching swoister, waved her hand to catch his attention. Embarrassed, he quickly gazed down at the coffin, pretending he hadn't seen her. Psst! He didn't move. Psst! He looked up. She gave him a big smile and winked. He nodded slightly. Father Finnegan closed his book, and mumbling the last blessing, noticed Maud. For a moment, he thought he recognized her. But before he was certain, she seemed to be overcome by grief and disappeared behind some people. He looked over at Harold. Harold looked down at the coffin. Father Finnegan concluded the prayer. The mourners, re the mourners responded, Amen, blessed themselves, and hurried to their cars. A moment, please, Father Finnegan, catching up with Harold. You're the chasing boy, aren't you? Uh, yes, Harold answered. Tell me, who is that old lady you were waving to earlier? I wasn't waving at her, she was waving at me. Just then, Maud drove by in Harold's hearse and stopped. She leaned out the window. Can I give you a lift, Harold? Harold was struck dumb. Father Finnegan walked around to the window. Excuse me, madam, he said, but are you not the lady who drove my car off yesterday? Was that the one with the St. Christopher medal on the dashboard? Yes. Then I suppose it was me. Hop in, Harold. Harold decided not to ask for explanations. He opened the door and got in. But where is it? asked Father Finnegan, becoming a little perturbed. Where is what? asked Maud. My car. Where did you leave it? Oh, that. I think perhaps it's at the orphanage. No, it's not, because I still had it at the African Art Center. Even better there, Father. Oh, you'll enjoy it. You'll have the most colorful... They have the most colorful carvings. Primitive, of course, but some are quite erotic. Realizing... Realization hit Father Finnegan. You painted the statues, he said. Oh, yes, said Maud brightly. How did you like them? Well, that's the point. I didn't. Don't be too discouraged, she said, realizing, releasing the break. Aesthetic appreciation always takes a little time. Bye-bye. Wait, Father Finnegan, but his voice was lost in the screeching tires and the roar of exhaust as Maud sped off in the hearse and turned the corner. Harold picked himself off the floor and looked off to, looked out the window. The gravestones merged together in a flickering blur of gray. <clears throat> Maud came to the entrance of the cemetery and spun out onto the main road, cruising about 60 miles an hour. She settled back and relaxed. What a delight it is, Harold, she said, bumping into you again. I knew we were going to be great friends from the moment I saw you. You go to funerals often, don't you? Harold had one hand braced on the dashboard and with the other hand on the back seat. Yes, he answered, without taking his eyes off the road. Oh, so do I. They're such fun, aren't they? It's all change, all revolving, burials and birth, the end to the beginning, the beginning to the end, the great circle of life. She made a, a sudden left, her, left hand turn that sent a terrified Volkswagen into a heart-stopping change of lanes. This old thing handles well. Ever drive a hearse, Harold? Harold swallowed. Yes, he said hoarsely. But, well, it's a new experience for me. She raced over a small hill, causing Harold's head to bounce repeatedly on the ceiling and made another sudden left-hand turn that threw the rear wheels into a mo momentary slide. Not too good on curves, she exclaimed, put her foot down on the gas. Shall I take you home, Harold? Harold, halfway between the seat and the floor, blurted out a faint, faintly, But this is my car. Your hearse? Yours! Maud stepped, out, stepped on the brakes and skidded to a dusty halt on the gravel by the side of the road. She looked over at him. Fancy that, she cooed. My, my. Then you shall take me home. 
Harold drove slowly and carefully as he listened to Maud elaborate on her system of acquiring cars. After his release from the penitentiary, Big Sweeney began work on a printing shop where I met him and we became friends. When he received the call and left for the monastery in Tibet, he gave his collection of keys to me as a present. Wasn't that nice? Of course I've had to make some additions for the newer models, but not as many as you'd think. Once you have your basic set, it's only a question, a variation. Do you mean that with this ring of keys you can get into any car you want and just drive off? Not any car. I like to keep a variety. I'm always looking for the new experience. Like this one. I liked it. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, there's my house. Over there. Harold pulled the hearse over and stopped before the clapboard cottage with a walnut tree in the front yard. Several other old houses stood nearby in spacious lots, some with barns or stables in the back, but across the street and down the hill the land had been subdivided. The houses there looked very much all alike, like small box-like, all crowded together. Looks as if the weather's cleared up, said Maud, getting out of the hearse. Harold closed her door. He was still troubled. But when you take these cars, he asked, don't you think you're, well, wronging the owners? What owners, Harold? We don't own anything. It's, all tra it's a transitory world. We come on the earth with nothing, and we go out with nothing. So isn't ownership a little absurd? I wonder if the post has come. She opened a wooden box on the porch and took out the mail. Oh, look, more books. I just sign their cards and they keep sending them to me. I received an encyclopedia in Dutch last week. Here, hold them, Harold. Will you, would you please? Harold took the books while Maud glanced through her letters. Very odd, too, she said, because I don't speak Dutch, German, French, English, some Spanish, Italian, and a little Japanese. Because I don't speak Dutch. Period. German, French, English, some Spanish, Italian, and a little Japanese but no Dutch. Of course, that's nothing against the Dutch. I thought the, qu the Queen Vilman was a wonderful woman. Come inside, Harold. I'll look at, those le at these later. Harold walked into the house and put the books down on the table. About those keys, he persisted, as Maud hung up her coat and hat. I still think you must be upsetting people when they find their cars gone. And I'm sure that that's not right. Well, she answered, if some people are upset because they feel they have a hold on some things, then I'm merely acting as a gentle reminder, sort of breaking it easy. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow, so don't get attached to things. Now, with that in mind, I'm not against collecting stuff. Why, look around you. I've collected quite a lot of stuff in my time. Harold looked around the large living room and was struck by the odd assortment of furnishings. No two chairs were alike. The couch was covered with a Persian rug. Colorful canvases hung on the walls. A baby grand piano stood in the corner next to a huge carving of a highly polished wood. And a, samor and a samor full of dried flowers sat on a tapa mat by the fireplace near some Japanese screens. It's very interesting, said Harold, somewhat at a loss for words. Very different. Oh, it's all foolish memorabilia, said Maud, going over to the window. Incidental, but not integral, if you know what I mean. Oh, come look, the birds. She opened the window and filled a small tin cup with, it, with seed and then releasing a spring that shot the, the cup out a long wire and dumped the seed on a bird table. Harold was impressed with the mechanical ingenuity of the device. Isn't that delightful, said Maud. This is my daily ritual. I love them so much. The only wildlife I get to see anymore. Look at them. Free as a bird. 
She took the empty bird seed box into the kitchen. One time I used to break into pet shops and liberate the canaries. But I gave it up as it's an idea way before its time. The zoos are full and prisons are overflowing. My, my, how the world so dearly loves a cage. She looked out the window over the sink. Look, Harold, there's Madame Arcret cultivating her garden. Yoo-hoo, she waved at the black-clad old woman, diligently hoeing in her large vegetable patch. But the old lady didn't notice. Maud sighed. She's really very sweet, but so old-fashioned. Please sit down, Harold. I'll put the kettle on and we'll have a, a nice hot cup of tea. Thank you, said Harold, but I really have to go. It's oat straw tea. You've never had oat straw tea, have you? No. Well, then, she smiled and picked up the kettle. No, really, thank you, but it's an appointment I, I shouldn't miss. Oh, at the dentist? Sort of. Well, then, you'll just have to come back and visit. All right, said Harold, and walked to the door. My door's always open. All right, see you soon. Okay, promise? Harold turned. I promise, he said, and smiled. a little bit more. <laughs> Dr. Harley's office ceiling was plastered and painted white. To the casual observer, thought Harold, it would look smooth, flat, and uninteresting. Harold, but to a searching eye, and over a period of time, the craftsman, the painter, and the plaster became visibly apparent, so that what he had noticed seemed dull and ordinary became fascinatingly impressionistic. Harold. A layer of plaster became a crackly desert of light and shade. A swirl of paint evoked a swell of a polar sea. You seem not to be listening, Harold. I asked you, do you have any friends? Harold abandoned his musings and concentrated on the question. No, he answered. None at all? Harold considering. Well, maybe one. Would you care to talk about this friend? No. Does your mother know about this friend? No. Is this a friend you had when you were away at school? No. I see. I see, Dr. Harley ran his hand over the back of his head. He decided on a new track. Were you happy at school? he asked. Yes. You like your teachers? Yes. Your classmates? Yes. Your studies? Yes. Then why did you leave? <clears throat> I burned down the chemistry building. Dr. Harley stood up slowly and walked to the window. He adjusted the blinds. We're not relating today, Harold, he said. I sense a definite lack of participation on your part. We are not communicating. No, I find you a very interesting case, Harold one with which I would like to continue, but this reluctance to commit yourself is detrimental to the psychoanalytical process and can only hinder the possibility of an effective treatment. Do you understand? Yes, said Harold. Very well, said Dr. Harley. He sat down. Tell me, Harold, he began after a pause. Do you remember your father at all? No, said Harold, and added, I'd have liked to. Really? Why? I'd have liked to talk to him. What would you say? I'm not sure. I'd show him my hearse and my stuff. What stuff? All the stuff in my room. My workbench, my chemistry set, my robe. A harness for hangings. My oxygen device for drownings. My poster of the Phantom of the Opera. I have a lot of things. They sound intriguing. Well, said Harold thoughtfully, they're incidental but not integral, if you know what I mean. Kind of leave off on page 43.
finishing page 42. See you next time. Have a good night. Thanks for joining me in my bus reading my book. Okay, bye.